All done. The New Testament reading for this day comes from uh, Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we, who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. And the next hymn is, How Blessed Are They Who Trust in Christ. Please stand and join me as we sing. Again, uh, looking at this month, looking at grief with the 23rd Psalm, we come back to it as we wrap this up, so we thought it was fitting to use it one more time. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord makes me lie down pastures. Leads me beside still waters, restores my life. Leads me in my Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And then the New Testament reading for this day, we're also going to use Revelation 21. This is the the end of the Bible. This is describing the kingdom to come, in which we read, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first first heaven and first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing cursed will be found there anymore, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. 
And there will be no more night, for they need no light of lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Amen. We have been using the 23rd Psalm, this image of walking through the valley of the shadow cast by death over this last month, to talk about how we, we will all walk through this valley, and that we prepare for it, that we, we all have tasks and questions while we're walking through it, that there are certain ways we can walk well with others. We spoke about that last week. One of the most important parts of this walk through the valley of the shadow is the fact that it does come to an end. We, we walk out of the valley. There is hope on the other side, side. The sun will rise again. There will be laughter and joy and feasting again, even after the death of a loved one. We grieve, as we always will, the, the death of someone we love, but we do not grieve as those who are without hope. This is what we hear Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica, saying, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus God will bring with him those who have died. Therefore encourage one another with these words. And so as we are told to encourage one another with these words, that's what we are here to gather today to, to do, to encourage one another about the ending of, of the valley, the coming out of the other side of the valley of, of the shadow. And this hope is not some sort of abstract hope of, oh, it'll be all right. There, there, it'll get better. The hope to which we, that we proclaim today is something substantial and concrete. It is something we can point at and say, that is where we're going. For our hope is described in Revelation. It's described as the, the kingdom of God that is to come. And when it comes in its fullness, we, we get a glimpse of this, that heaven and earth will be made new. That there will be a holy city, a new Jerusalem, that God will dwell among his people. And there, every tear will be wiped away and death will be no more. Running through this city will, will be the river of the water of life with the tree of life on the bank. And on this tree will be the, the tr on, on the banks of this river will be the tree with the leaves for the healing of the nations. That is uh, the hope to, towards which we are pointed. That's the, the hope towards which we walk. That is our hope that as we walk out of the valley of the shadow cast by death, that we are one step closer to this kingdom as it comes. And so if that's the hope that we're proclaiming today, what does it look like to finish this leg of the journey, to finish this, this walk through the valley, to come out on the other side and to be one step closer to the kingdom? Well, what happens to grief over time such that we can keep on on this journey? I know there's not a simple answer, and I wanted to have a, a width of experience, a breadth of experience from which to speak about grief. The, how do pe different people experience the, this walking out of the valley of the shadow? How do people experience grief as, as it progresses? And so, that, and so that I wanted to, because I wanted to hear from a whole bunch of people, I asked Facebook. And I was told many, many stories. And I'm honored by all the stories I was told. And as I listened to all the various people tell me their stories of grieving various loved ones, it seemed like there were various ways that people processed and handled grief. There was, there was an entire group of people that when they, they... Grief was for them something that was like a heavy burden. That was like something that made it hard to breathe. Something they had it felt like they were carrying it. And, and they carried this. And after a time, after months or so, they, they, uh, one person was telling me she was praying. And, and then she felt this weight lifted. And it was like God was saying to her, the person who's died is in my care. And she was free to move on. And so I talked, I, I listened to stories like that. People, I heard a story of a woman who, uh, whose son had died tragically over in, in Kirksville in the lake there. And it was the same type of thing. After months of just this feeling of oppression and depression, she got to a point where this feeling of peace just pushed, just came across her like warm water, as she put it. And, and afterwards, she, she could find joy again because she, she knew that her son was with God. And so for some, the, the, walking out of the valley was just 
It's like coming over the ridge, and there it is, the sunrise, and it's, you can move on. And, and then I talked to other folks who, who told me that, that grieving coming out of the valley was like a, there was a series of steps to it. I was talking to someone who told me um, at first, for the first period of time, she was so wrapped up in her own grief that she could not see anyone else's pain. And, and it was just so wrapped up in her own problems and struggles and, and that the transition came first when she was talking to someone in the grocery store who was telling her about a problem in, in their life. And she realized that she cared and that her grief and her pain had, tur- had, had ceased turning her so inwards that now she could care about, about someone else's pain. And then that was a, a big transition, and then, then months after that, it, quite a while after that, came a point at which another transition happened, and she realized that she could tell a story of her mother who had died and laugh before she cried. And, and that was a big deal. She could laugh at the good times before she cried that they weren't anymore. And, and so I heard stories about that like that, about people who... Uh, for them, grief was a series of transitions. There was what, that stage, and then there was the next stage, and then the, there was... And, and then I talked to folks, I listened to stories of folks for whom there was no... Trend, there was not a sudden change, it wasn't transitions, it was just... They were grieving, and then eventually they were coping, and eventually they were living again. I, I was talking to someone who had lost both parents, and, and this person was telling me there was not a day that not thinking about those parents and, and just over time just learn to live again and, and, and there was no there wasn't anything that she that she could describe just it was what it was and, and so it there is no right answer about how long or how how what how long or what grief will look like for any person there is no certainty except for this I, I made the mistake of, of saying uh, when is grief done And pretty much everyone told me it's never done. Grief is never done. You're never finished with it. What what you do is is learn to live with that baggage. When when we have loved someone so deeply that we can't imagine living life without them, and then we do, well, you never really fully get over that. Now, so, so over time, there are always going to be days that are hard, no matter how grief, how each of us experiences grief as, as one event or transitions or gradual. We will always be, in some way, grieving the loss of a loved one. And there will always be days that are hard. Birthdays, anniversaries. Um, it could be other more unexpected days. I, I know of a couple that would always call a grandchild and sing happy birthday and then when one grandparent didn't have the other grandparent to sing with on the phone that was that was hard and and so there are going to be changes um and they will be challenging i I will tell you the the hardest change i I watch families go through when it comes to grieving is how to handle holidays even years later how to handle the holidays can be quite a deal i i saw this this week i was doing a Ralph Hatcher's sister passed away a week ago today, and, and, and in preparing to do her funeral, I, I, I heard about the bell that Twyla would ring, Twyla Williams, she had this bell, and she, when she rang that bell, the family sat down and prayed and ate. That was what the family does, or family did. And now the question is, what will the family do? Will they ring the bell again? Because for some people, to ring the bell, they can't imagine not ringing the bell because that's what we have been doing. That's what makes us family. For others, to ring the bell would be such a marker of everything lost that they can't bear to do it. And and so different people will respond to holidays differently. And so if there's one practical piece of advice in this entire sermon, it's this. When a loved one dies, talk about the holidays sooner than later because you you might be surprised about what people think. As I was putting this together, as I was thinking about grieving and how there are some people handle it in one way or another way, about how it impacts holidays, how there are days that are always going to be hard, and how grieving is a process we're never fully done with, but we learn to live because we do point towards that joy again. I, I was thinking about cats. I found myself thinking about cats. In particular, I found myself thinking of one particular cat. This is Jackson. This is my uh, friend Lauren's cat. Jackson lives uh, down in uh, St. Louis. And I met Jackson a couple weeks ago. 
uh, when I was down at Lauren's house for a couple days. And, and what you can't tell from the picture is that's a very playful cat who, who runs to you and jumps in your lap and wants to really play. And, and of course, as soon as you go to take a picture, Jackson looks like a slug. That's how cats work. But uh, I, I wanted, I just was thinking about Jackson and uh, let me show you Jackson in action. Jackson would run to me every time I walked in the door except when I wanted him to. And so you can see my friend Lauren's hand as he's beckoning the cat to, to come to me. And he finally does. And you notice, Jackson's got a hitch in his giddy up, doesn't he? Because Jackson's missing a leg. That's a three-legged cat. But that's a fun cat. That cat loves to play and dance and, and jump and chase lasers. And, and I was thinking about three-legged cats, and I, uh, I typed three-legged cats into YouTube. I found this. You always, always be careful typing in cat videos into YouTube. And uh, some others, this is, uh, I don't know the name of this, Nikki, this is Nikki the cat. And Nikki the cat is missing her rear leg and it's not slowing her down at all, as you can see. And um, thinking about cats. You see the thing about a cat is that it can't grow a leg back, can it? Once it's lost a leg, that's it, the leg is gone. It's meant to run on four legs, but this cat, they, they did it in slow motion so you can see how this cat does it. It's pretty impressive. A cat is meant to run on four legs. It's meant to run and to dance and to play. And when it loses something it was always meant to have, it's gone. But it doesn't mean it stops playing. It just has to learn to play in a new way. And, and I think we are like that when we lose someone that we love. I, there are people, as I said, there are people that I cannot imagine my life without. And, and if I lost them, I, I don't know what I would do. And yet, I would figure out something, eventually. And, and when you lose, when a, th when a cat loses a third, uh, it's, it, when a cat loses a leg, it learns to run and to dance and to play again, and we are the same. When we learn, lose someone we love, there's always gonna be something missing, but there's always tomorrow, and the sun will rise again, and we will learn to dance and to play and to feast and to laugh. And it'll never be quite the same. I mean, you watch Jackson roll over and kind of bat at a toy, and you can see the stump of the arm or the shoulder that's there kind of, it's never quite the same, but it's still a fun cat. When, we get, when it gets to the point where we are walking out of the valley of the shadow, when we are learning to run again and to dance and to play and rejoice, even if we're like a three-legged cat, and it's not quite right, but we're still doing it, there is one more thing we can do, and this is how I, I want to make sure we wrap up talking about grief. When we walk out of the valley of the shadow of death, we can choose to be able to go back in. Because... When we go back, we can go back in when the people we love are there themselves. Paul tells us that God can use all things for the good of those who love him. And, and that's not saying that all things are good, but it is saying all things can be used for good. And in the same way, while I would not wish the experience of grief, grief on anyone, it is true that once we have gone through grief such as this, when we see someone we love going through it, we can go back to help them go through what we have survived. But I think that's part of what Jesus talks about when he says, love your neighbor, even if it means carrying your cross. I know that by no means I have covered everything over this last month talking about, talking about grief. I know that there's still much we could cover, but, but I think we've covered enough. That we can prepare for the valley of the shadow of death. That we will walk through it. That we will walk through it with questions and tasks. And it'll be hard. That we can help each other walk through it. And that when we come out on the other side, we will be able to laugh and to run and to play and to feast again, even if we are missing something we thought we'd never be able to walk without. I believe that as we do this, when we do this walking with God, that we will experience God's presence with us. That we will learn that we truly can grieve as people who, who do have hope. A marvelous hope in the king, kingdom to come. Thanks be to God. Amen.
We now come to a time when we confess when we have fallen short of this. We receive God's grace and forgiveness. Please join with me as we confess together. Merciful God, we confess we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your law. We have broken your law. We have against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the need. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. My friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, this proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Now as a forgiving and peacemaking people, then let us stand and offer each other signs of that peace. <laughs>